Thank you both for being here. Uh, Saskatchewan and Manitoba are the, the Canadian breadbasket, the, the heartland of the nation, uh, and uh, uh, huge uh, resource producers and uh, important actually for the world food supply, both of your provinces. Um, you actually have got economically a number of similarities, also some, some differences. Both provinces in quite good fiscal health uh, at the moment, uh, high labor participation and so on. So there's sort of a you know, I guess just setting the table a bit, um, maybe you could each uh, uh, speak about uh, um, the outlook for the economy for your, your regions, um, maybe for Western Canada more broadly, and, you know, what are you thinking about as we head into 2024? And Rod, we'll start with you. Okay, thank you, Derek. Um, yeah, uh, you, you're exactly right, uh, both provinces. Saskatchewan is a... Uh, as a producer of agricultural products, uh, farming is in its DNA since its inception. So uh, grains, uh, canola oil, which is, uh, is a product that was introduced in Saskatchewan and Manitoba and introduced to the world and has become a $5 billion uh, export uh, to China and other parts of the, of the world. Um, and also expanding into uh, the plant-based proteins like lentils, peas, and so forth, and exporting those. So. Um, so as you can imagine, it's, uh, it's a fairly stable economy. There's significant resources as well, uh, natural resources beneath the ground. Um, so the big three, we call it in Saskatchewan anyway, is, uh, is potash, uh, uranium, and oil and gas. Uh, that uh, kind of balances out the agricultural swings. So uh, ag has its own cycle. Uh, generally, uh, each of those commodities can have their own cycle. Uh, so. Um, Sometimes they go all together, like in the 2000s, where they, uh, they all ran in, up in price. But generally, it does provide some buffer uh, to the general GDP growth uh, in the province and uh, does help us keep those uh, uh, unemployment numbers quite low. Nicoletta, Manitoba, what is, the, what is the view from the center of the country? Um, thank you. Um, I mean, what uh, we have seen is that the Manitoba economy has remained uh, resilient in the first half of, of this year. What we are seeing is that the economic indicators are trending um, up, however, at a much slower pace than what we saw in, in 2022. What we're seeing is that, that sales from retail and, and from wholesale and manufacturer sectors um, are continue to increase at a, at a steady space, um, pace. Now, because of this, the economic outlook for the current fiscal year has been revised higher from what we've um, forecasted at budget time. So what we're seeing now when, in terms of uh, nominal GDP growth for the province for current year is an increase to 3% growth from 2.2 is what we forecasted at budget time. Um, now, we've talked today about um, higher inflation, higher interest rates, um, and the uncertainty that comes with that. So we have revised our, our outlook for 2024, um, and our GDP growth for next fiscal year has been revised lower to 2.8% uh, uh, on, on the nominal side, and um, a modest growth of 0.8% uh, for real GDP. Um, in terms of, of the labor market, I mean, we are seeing a, a strong labor market um, employment uh, gains of, of about 2.2% for, for the current year. But again, we're forecasting that to, to moderate uh, next year with about just under 1% increase. Unemployment as well, on the back of that, we're, we're forecasting that to um, um, to increase uh, for next fiscal year. Um, but Manitoba is among one of the most diversified um, economies in, in Canada, and we have generally fared better um, when there are um, downturns in global um, economy. Thank you. So uh, let's turn to the investment side. Uh, in particular, um, as you mentioned, you know, we have a, a high-ish inflation environment. Um, Inflation appears to be receding, but still kind of uncomfortably high. Uh, and also, at least broadly in Canada, a slowing growth uh, profile. So, uh, and obviously um, a, a huge uh, volatility in, in, in rates in, in, in the past uh, little while. So how, does, uh, how these, do these factors present uh, challenges for you in your financing strategies 
how are you thinking of them as you, you know, as you plan how, you, how you're going to finance operations and capital uh, in the years ahead? And, and uh, we'll start with you. So our debt management strategy focuses on building um, just liquidity in the domestic market. Um, our focus has been uh, to, uh, to build uh, benchmark sizes in, in the 10 and 30 year uh, part of, of the curve. And I think that has served our, our program really well in this uh, environment of, of higher uh, volatility. Because what we're seeing and what we're hearing is that investors are looking uh, to invest in, in more liquid, uh, liquid names. Um, now, our uh, strategy also focuses on uh, minimizing borrowing costs by um, accessing international um, markets. Uh, so the province does have uh, set up a uh, U.S. dollar program registered with the SEC. We have um, a European medium-term note program as well as an Australian program. Um, we've done in some years as much as 40% of our, our, our borrowing in international markets, and we always look for opportunity um, to, to access international markets. Um, we were um, recently, uh, this past July, we were in the U.S. market, and we were able to issue a 10-year, um, 1 billion global debenture, and our focus is going to be, or, or the goal is to be in the U.S. market once a year. Rod, your view, your view on the, the financing uh, challenges of, uh, of this particular environment? Mm. Yeah, the, um, well, I'll just say we, we've uh, uh, endeavored to try to have liquid benchmarks as well when we're uh, issuing bonds. Our challenge has been in the last couple of years that we're, uh, with surpluses, uh, you know, the ability to build up those benchmarks has been difficult. So our, our borrowing programs were smaller. We think we'll revert to, to more borrowing uh, in the coming years as as, uh, as our revenues normalize. Um, but speaking to the, the interest rate environment right now, it is, uh, and in the inflation environment, it does pro uh, pose a few little good things and bad things for governments. Off the start, I think a lot of provincial governments, and we included, were experiencing more revenues. <clears throat> inflation was impacting the prices of goods and services. Uh, consumption taxes are based on on, uh, on those prices. Um, so, uh, so we did see an uptick in consumption taxes, uh, uh, we have natural resource revenues that are based on the prices of those and they're based on the prices in U.S. dollars, uh, so um, more revenues from those. Uh, but generally I would say it's, it's probably a net negative. It's been a long time since we've experienced inflation like this, uh, uh, a very long time, and generally it, it does slow down consumption and, uh, and incomes uh, and tax revenues that go along with that. So uh, it's been a challenge. And then on the other side, of course, just fiscally speaking, the expense side starts to rise. So we've got collective bargaining agreements with major employee groups underway. Um, uh, capital expenditures are, are definitely going up. Everybody has experienced that. So, um, you know, that's, that's not where I make decisions, where I work, but it feeds into our amount of borrowing. So we have to be ready to, uh, you know, to, uh, to issue in a manner that lowers the risk for the province, uh, including exposure to continuing rising interest rates. And for us, that means generally borrowing longer um, uh, to lock in those rates because we do have somewhat of a volatile revenue stream on our resources. Uh, we heard uh, Stefan Marion uh, er earlier in the first session of the day talk about you know, maybe 100 basis points of, of, of a decline in the policy rate next year. I mean, obviously the Plenty of headwinds in the Canadian economy, as we've been hearing all morning. Is it, is it tempting to, to borrow more short in, in an environment where it looks highly likely that short rate, I mean, short rates are already coming down, but they might actually fall pretty sharply next year? Um, you know, how do you guys think about that? Because you both said here you, 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 you tend to go further out in the curve. Uh, I think it's, uh, it is tempting. Um, it's also... You know, sort of dangerous for a major borrower to to kind of make calls like that. Uh, you know, the consensus is isn't always correct, and so it's better to balance things off on the margins. I think um, it seems like you could build a story for borrowing in three to five year sector from an issuer perspective, and you could build a a good um, thesis from an investor perspective to buy bonds in that part of the curve because it's you know you may see the most improvement if there are those cuts that happen, but. 
generally, uh, we're, we're, we build a plan, we, we sort of stick to it. Uh, and, and in the last two years also, where investors, investors have been more vocal about what they need in terms of term to maturity and other features. So, uh, you know, the, our, I guess the long, <laughs> short way of saying is we don't, we don't really want to make too huge a call on, on where rates are going, but stick to something that's balanced and diversified. I mean, we do have a, a short-term borrowing program. I mean, we have a weekly treasury uh, bill auction. We have a promissory note program. But we've used these programs uh, mainly for cash management purposes as well to, to manage our, our um, fixed floating split for our debt portfolio. And we're, we're going to continue to use it for, for these purposes. Um, what we want is, is to reduce that volatility in, in public debt expense um, and keeping... Um, um, you know, with our strategy of in, in issuing in the 10 and 30 year part of the curve, um, it is going to, to help us reduce that volatility. Um, now, um, you know, if we go, we look at the uh, five year part of the curve as, as being shorter given our, our focus. Um, so traditionally, we have left that part of the curve to issue in the US market just because the arbitrage has worked better for us. Um, this year, like I mentioned earlier, we issued in the 10 years. So that leaves space in our debt maturity profile to take a look at the five year part of the curve in the domestic market if there is a need and, and if there's an opportunity to issue there. <coughs> Uh, so you mentioned uh, used the good word vocal. Investors have been more vocal. This was uh, you guys are are, are uh, uh, repeat attendees here because you did one of these panels last year. And I think at the time you said that uh, uh, there were some indications that, uh, given the rate volatility at the time, there were some buyers sitting on the sidelines. So what are investors being vocal about right now? And are they are they are some of them just sort of waiting to see if, if rates settle? Nicoletta. Yeah, I, I, you know, what we're hearing from investors is that they're looking for, for that liquidity, for liquid names when, when they decide to, to invest, uh, hence our, our, our focus on that. Um, I do think um, investors are on the sign, like with the, our international programs, I mean, especially the, the Australian uh, program, uh, we haven't been in that market for about two years now. And when we go to international markets, it is arbitrage based. So the volatility, when, when we look at, at the ARBs, uh, the volatility makes uh, that ARBs move very quickly. So we have to move quickly as well. Uh, but uh, what we're seeing is that when that ARBs work, the investor may not be there because of, of the volatility and because they're, they're on the sideline just waiting to see um, if that volatility is going to subside. Uh, yeah, and I think the, you know, three years of bear market and bonds has, has kind of uh, changed the landscape somewhat. Uh, generally, uh, you know, and I'm not sure, but uh, it's, it's a new phenomenon for, for bond investors. And uh, so uh, I think they're, they're looking for liquidity um, and they're looking for specific uh, terms to fit a need, say if it's in a structured type portfolio. Um, but it's, uh, uh, it's you, you feel it. It uh, you know the books compared to two or three years ago, or even during the pandemic, there were quite a you know we funded a lot during the pandemic, and there were buyers. Now it just seems a, a, a quite a bit harder. Uh, I also look to the fact that central banks are are sellers, not buyers anymore. So that's a big swing in terms of supply, and uh, and um, and governments are borrowing uh, as well. So um, it's. Uh, I don't know if it's, you know, it's just the investors and, uh, you know, they're, when you have a bear market in bonds, the whole bond portfolio gets smaller. So there's not as much available to go around in the, as well. So we have to be attuned to uh, what investors are looking for and, and be nimble. And I think, uh, um, for example, going, borrowing offshore when the arbitrage is not in your favor is, is probably going to be coming more of a, uh, a necessary uh, thing for for provinces or for this province to do anyway. Well, I mean, maybe that's a good opportunity for you to speak about about when you, because uh, uh, the Canadian dollar market can meet most of Saskatchewan's needs, but how you think about and when you go to uh, to to other currencies and, and the U.S. dollar market. Um, what's your, what's the strategy? Well, it's a it's an it's a new strategy for us. Uh, we last we uh, issued a billion uh, dollars in. June of 2022, 
Uh, but before that, it had been 1994 since we had entered into the U.S. market. So um, our strategy when we developed it was to uh, get our total outstanding to about 25% of our, our debt. And we're at, uh, we're at 5% now. So, uh, after we did that dollar deal, uh, our uh, revenues increased dramatically because of uh, commodity price increases as a result of the, the war uh, in the Ukraine and Russia, with Russia. And um, we didn't need to borrow again. But going forward, it's, uh, yeah, going to the dollar market. Uh, we refreshed our EMTN program. And to get to 25%, that means we have to do more than 25% of our annual borrowing in, that, in those markets. And looking forward between uh, refinancing existing debt from the pandemic, uh, pretty aggressive capital spending plans that we'll, we'll have enough bonds to, to meet that, to get to, you know, 30 or 40 percent in uh, international markets and still access the Canadian market. Right. You, you did that U.S. dollar deal several months ago. Uh, any plans to go back to uh, Euro, Aussie, uh, or anything, anything else sort of on the horizon for, for Manitoba? So we don't have set targets for, for international issuance. Uh, when we do issue, um, it is arbitrage-based, so we look at, at levels uh, compared to where we can issue in the domestic market. And given the size of our, of our program, there is capacity to, to do that in the domestic market. Um, but we do um, you know, like to diversify our investor base. Um, we also uh, look at international markets to, to minimize our, our borders borrowing cost and to take pressure off the, the domestic market. Um, so there is, um, you know, no strict um, um, targets for international issuance, but when the opportunity does uh, present, uh, we do uh, take a look at, uh, you know, if it fits with our maturity uh, schedule and, and if it is, uh, if we're able to, to swap that back to, to Canadian, that's another important factor for us. Um, any international um, issuance that we do, we swap all of that back to, to Canada. Uh, so we don't take on any foreign exchange um, um, exposure. And we need to be able to uh, um, have access to the swap market and do it on a cost-effective way. And Saskatchewan is the same, right? You don't, do, you don't play currency risk, really. No, no, we do. Uh, correct, we don't play currency risk. Um, and uh, but there's uh, some interesting things there, and we probably won't ever play currency risk. But I, I touched on it earlier. Our, our revenues on re non-renewable resources are based on companies that sell in U.S. dollars. So when their profits go up, it's, uh, it can be because the U.S. dollar was stronger. Uh, so there's some some hedges in there that could uh, natural hedges if we ever borrowed uh, unhedged uh, to small amounts that we might consider that. But it would be on the margin. It's just risky. You made, a, you made an interesting point about um, a, a few minutes ago about you know, competition and demand and how it, how it has changed. How much interaction is there between yourselves and, and your federal counterparts on like, you know, there, because I mean, obviously they have a massive borrowing program. Uh, it's more oriented towards the short term end of the curve, but there's still mm -hmm. competition. What, what are those discussions like or, or, or do they consult with you? They do. There's a great relationship with the provinces and uh, and our federal counterparts at uh, at finance. Um, you know, we're we're it's there open lots of dialogue. The the issues are not uh, significant when they do come up, but there's more of an exchange of ideas. And probably the larger provinces would be better to speak to to what that uh, relationship gets like. I think you know those are ones that are are maybe more impactful. Uh, in discussions because they have larger borrowing programs, but um, you know I think uh, the um, you know there's the the federal government has been supportive of uh, and is involved with the provincial borrowing side of things, and uh, so that relationship is, in my opinion, very good. Um, one feature of of um, I mean, you're blessed with resources, um, but the resources can also bring Revenue volatility, as you know, as as, as mentioned, and and uh, um, both your provinces have been, been been blessed in recent years, but that won't necessarily continue. So, so how do you mitigate that kind of uh, revenue volatility risk? Is there something that you can do, you know, in in your roles um, uh, to help smooth things out? <laughs> 
Well, I mean, um, revenue uh, collection, the taxes that we collect the revenue on, um, it, it is all uh, based on, you know, where the economic outlook is and, and forecasted based on that. Uh, we have included in our, our budget contingencies uh, for <coughs> revenue risk. And we will continue to uh, to include that uh, just to to mitigate against um, against the risk. Um, I mean, in terms of you know the budgetary process, and as we're going through that that right now, uh, we do look at at forecast and how to best um, you know include that part of the the budgetary process, uh, because what we are seeing um, on the revenue side, both personal and and corporate income tax due to the higher inflation slowdown in, in a common that is uh, forecasted to, to come in uh, lower than, than where we had them forecasted a budget. So we just, uh, and, and that's, like you said, it's not just Manitoba, it, it is other jurisdictions as well. So it's part of the budgetary process that, that uh, we include contingencies and, and look at uh, economic forecast. Um, let's talk briefly about about ESG and uh, uh, in the case of Saskatchewan, you you do have a, a uh, an energy grid that's based on natural gas and coal primarily, and there's a there's a longer term plan to uh, to uh, to transition to to cleaner sources in part. Um, tell us about the financing plans for that. Is there a, you know a, a consideration of a transition bond or green bond type of uh, of product as part of that? Uh, right, correct. So the, the current plan, uh, so uh, you know, about 80% comes from coal or natural gas. Coal is about 30% of the grid and uh, obviously legacy, those are the resources the province has and uh, those will be phased out by 2030 uh, as part of an agreement with the federal government uh, and replaced with, uh, with, more, with natural gas um, and uh, solar, wind, import, import hydro. Um, to uh, to uh, to get to 50% renewables uh, at that time in 2030, uh, those gas plants are obviously cleaner than coal, but they will need to be replaced too. Uh, the target for the province is to have that completed by 2050, and to do that, uh, natural gas, those plants that have just been built, their useful life will run out, and that act as a bridge um, towards uh, small modular reactors, which are nuclear reactors that are more like 350 megawatts rather than, than a thousand. Um, so uh, uh, those, there's an MOU between Alberta, uh, Ontario, Saskatchewan and Manitoba to develop these. And one's being built now in Darlington in, uh, uh, in Ontario and th those would be rolled out. So we've got two sites picked in Saskatchewan for them but those wouldn't start, we wouldn't start building those until 2029. And they're about $6 billion each rather than $600 million. So $12 billion, kind of like what the minister in Quebec had said about uh, $100 billion. Ours is more like 10 to $15 billion. Uh, so financing is yet to be determined. But all those sources that he mentioned, uh, you know, we have his power company, but uh, it, it might not be able to, uh, it may be decided that it doesn't finance at all. It may be decided that it is, but there would be private partnerships, um, uh, Canada Infrastructure Bank, other other areas that would help with that financing because uh, it is an important transition and it probably carries some of that same, you know, national scope which is uh, the federal government's desire to to green the whole grid and um, and I think that's probably um, you know one of the targets is to have federal involvement in that transition. Is there anything we should know about uh, about Manitoba Hydro's uh, sort of capital plans that would affect you know your your um, your outlook for financing? Um, so Manitoba Hydro just recently finished um, uh, some large capital uh, programs um, and uh, there is no plans right now to start any large capital programs but uh, Hydro did release uh, integrated um, the IRP uh, back in August. We take a look at, at the opportunities uh, going forward um, in terms of, of uh, supplying energy to uh, not just Manitoba but op other opportunities that are out there. Uh, currently, you know, the energy that's supplied by, by Manitoba Hydro, 97% of that is electric clean energy 
energy. Another about 2% uh, is, is wind energy that, that's being supplied. So fairly green. Um, and, and they're looking at you know, what the future looks like in the next 10 uh, to, to 20 years. And with that, we have run out of time. But thank you so much, Rod and Nicoletta, for your time and for joining us today.